That's what happens, right? All that, all that energy. Yeah. All right, Acts chapter 2. Let's go. I'm getting in enough trouble here. I've already insulted Andrew and Lee, so I'm good. We're ready to go. <laughs> Amen. We're done. I got to keep those guys on their toes, though. They've been... Do they insult you daily? Your customers do? Oh, I know. Amen. Acts chapter 2 here. Back in the book of Acts here, and... Uh, we are going to cover tonight Joel's prophecy that we find in Acts chapter 2 and in the book of Joel. We're going to cover that and, and kind of deal with some of the charismania mistakes that are, that, are, that are attributed to this passage of Scripture that has really taken away from what Peter's sermon was about and has kind of distorted it a bit. So first I'm going to go through some of my notes, and then uh, David clouded some really good uh, notes that he broke down on that, that he writes really well in the charismatic movement and uh, uh, in understanding that and I think it's profitable so I want to use that tonight too as well uh, some of those notes here but Acts chapter 2 and verse number 16 but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel and it shall come to pass in the last days saith God I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we pray you'd help us with this portion of Scripture tonight. Lord, help us to understand it. Help us to be edified by it. Help us to learn and grow in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We first notice that Peter, when he starts this sermon, he is appealing to Scripture. I think it's important to notice that, that Peter's message is very scriptural to them, his answer to them. He is appealing to the Bible. When Peter wants to answer these men, he goes right to the authority. It's not Peter's popery, right? Peter's not being the pope. Peter's not uh, claiming ex cathedra. He's not, he's not claiming he's infallible. He doesn't tell them to bow the knee to him, right? He doesn't take on that type of authority. He doesn't claim that he is God on earth, as the pope does, all right? He uses scripture. Where does he go? Well, turn your Bibles to Joel chapter 2. See if you can find that, some of you. I'm going to be looking at all of you. Can anybody find it? Let's see. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Turn in your Schofield Bibles. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, in your Schofield Bible, I, I, I thought I'd give you a flashback, Andrew. <laughs> huh? That's right. See? I don't have the page number for you, though. Sorry. Joel 2.28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Isn't that an interesting word? So when you see that word shall be saved, when you see that word saved and you see that word delivered, it means the same thing. It's the same exact thing. Okay? To be delivered, people, they have deliverance ministries. Well, the best deliverance ministry you could have is salvation in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the one that delivers you from your sins. Amen? He is the one that delivers you. You don't need to have a 12-step program. You don't need to have a deliverance ministry where people are laying hands on you and casting out devils out of you and doing all these other things. You don't have to have that because it says here, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered, it says, shall be saved. To be saved is to be delivered. Amen. It is deliverance. Uh, I've heard people try to complicate the gospel so much and try to say, well, look, you've got to go through all these. You, you, 
you know, Bill Schneblin and those other nut job charismatics out there that that and he is a charismatic, whether he wants to admit it or not, he is. But uh, th those guys out there, they have those deliverance ministries, they say, and you have to go through all these hoops that you don't see in the scriptures at all, by the way. They're made up fantasy land things from a chick comic book or something somewhere. And, and, that, and that's what they're made up with. And this that's their deliverance. No, you don't need to go through all that. I don't need to take you into a wayback machine. You tell me everything you ever did wrong in your whole life from the time you were a child all the way through to be delivered from something. That's not Bible. It is torture, but it's not Bible. What the Bible says is, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be delivered. Amen. Shall be delivered. That's the power of God. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. What was that? That was salvation that was preached in Mount Zion and preached from Jerusalem, right? Isn't that what we see? Where did it begin? Where did the gospel begin? Jerusalem. Amen. That's where salvation, that's where the message began, right there. In Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and the remnant whom the Lord shall call. All right, so then let our appeal always be to the scriptures as was Peter's. Now then, if we look at these verses, though, we have to break them down and teach on them because there's a lot of doctrinal error taught today in many of these verses, a lot of it. If you've ever been in a charismatic church or a, a, a tongue-speaking church or any of those other ones, they always teach these verses in a, in a perverted manner. One thing they teach is uh, that all these gifts that are talked about and all these things that happen are all permanent, but they are not. They are not meant to be. When God is ready to begin something and do something, he shows signs and wonders. He did that, and then he gave us the scriptures. All right, the New Testament. After that, there will come a time when God will begin to show signs and wonders again, or he will allow them to be shown again. And that is at the end of the end times, right? Before that great day of the Lord, which we'll talk about. Amen? Just a little bit. So the Bible talks about here in Acts chapter 2, it deals with these signs and wonders that are going to take place. These temporary things that are going to happen. Uh, talks about uh, how God's spirit would be poured out upon all flesh, right? And, and the young men would dream dreams and the old men would see visions, or the young men would see visions, young men, old men would dream dreams and things of that nature. So we see dreams and visions talked about here. Uh, Stephen had his vision, didn't he, in Acts chapter 7, verse number 55. He looked up into the heavens when he was going to die, and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father, ready to receive him, right? Ready to receive him. That was the vision that he saw. There was a purpose for that vision. Then we see Peter and Cornelius. How about them? Acts chapter 10, both of them have visions, right? They have visions that are given. Peter has a vision, and, 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 and everything comes down. It shows him the animals, tells him, uh, take and eat and do this, and then go see Cornelius. And the angel of the Lord came to Cornelius and told him, hey, listen, uh, go send for Peter. Go to Joppa, send for a man named Peter and Simon the Tanner's house. Go there, and he'll be there, and, and was very specific. And what did they do? They did. Why? They didn't have a, they didn't have a New Testament. Cornelius didn't have the gospel. God doesn't have to do that now. Why? Because he gave us a more sure word of prophecy. So we don't have to have visions and angelic visitations and things like that. We don't, that's not necessary. Why? Because we have the word of God, which, is, which in, in the book of Hebrews says, God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Right? So we, we don't need those now. How about Paul on the road to Damascus? He had a vision. Because there was a purpose for that vision. Every time God does that, there was a purpose for that. You know, some men, I would say, and your old men shall dream dreams. I think that is referencing John on the island of Patmos. John was dreaming on the island of Patmos. He was in the, in the spirit on the Lord's day. I believe it was a dream that he was having, just like Daniel's dream that Daniel had. When he had dreams and visions and things. So, and John was an old man when he did that. He was on the Isle of Patmos. He was an old man. He was by himself. He came back and lived in Ephesus until he died. I think he was a member of the Church of Ephesus. Historically speaking, that's what it seems like it says. But um, anyway, he was, he was an old man, and he had the visions and the dreams of what was going to take place in the future. And that coincides with the prophecy that was put on him by the Lord that he wouldn't die until the Lord came back. And he came back to him till he saw the Lord. And when did he see him? He saw him on the Isle of Patmos. And then later he died. 
but he lived a, to a, a ripe old age from, from what history says. So um, notice here that when the Spirit is poured upon all flesh, there's not an age restriction there, uh, but there is a proper order that is there um, that, you know, it doesn't say that, and we're going to get to that with women and, and, and the movement of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about that a little bit here tonight because I think that's very important to, to cover and to put into perspective because there's a lot of misunderstandings, and that's why you have all these prophetesses and these women that stand up, and they believe they have authority to preach in the assembly, and they have, they have authority to, to be pastors and all these other things, which there's not one female pastor in the Bible. There are a bunch of Jezebels, but there's not a female pastor in the Bible. There is a prophetess that did, when they call themselves a prophetess, they model themselves after who? Jezebel, who was a prophetess and did what? Seduce the servants of the Lord to sin. Like Joyce Meyer, like what's that other whore's name, the blonde-haired whore that Donald Trump likes? Yeah, that blonde-haired whore that Donald Trump likes, that all the Republicans are like hoorah and over. You know Donald Trump, the guy that is hooked up with the blonde whore? You know, the one that was caught. You say, that's not a very nice caller whore. Well, she was caught in a hotel room with Benny Hinn in Rome. That's a whore, and she was married. Is that too direct speech? I don't think it is. Listen, your children ought to understand what a whore is and, what, and how God hates whoredom. God hates perversion. He hates whoredom. He absolutely hates it. And you ought to hate it too. You ought to hate what God hates and love what God loves. So then you ought to hate a religious whore worst of all. It ought to be, religious whoredom ought to be hated above all. It ought to be. Because it's wicked. You may not hate the person, but you ought to hate what they do. That's what I meant by that, by the way. But religious whoredom, you ought to hate. Because it's seducing. And what do these women do? Joyce Meyer, um, you know, Paula White, all these women, what are they doing? Seducing the Lord's servants to sin. Uh, SDA, the SDA woman, that crazy psychotic nut job, Ellen G. White, yeah. And all the limperous men that follow her. Yes, they are. They have all the same effeminate spirit. But anyway, so the point is, is that, but that's where it got out of hand. That's why everything went that way. That's why people became consumed with it. And now you have to have men that stand up and say things like I just said. Because most of the time it's not going to be said. And that was the part of destroying the roles of the sexes. That was part of destroying all of that. Destroying any distinction. Don't think they want to do that? Well, now we have Boy Scouts that are Girl Scouts and Girl Scouts that are Boy Scouts. And boys and boys that join the girls' dance team. I got to be honest with you. When I was a lost boy, I would have joined the girls' dance team too. I'm just, I, I, I'm not lying to you. I would have done that, been like, join the girls' dance. Well, sure I will. Why wouldn't I? Right? I was a lost, wicked devil. Sure I would have. But, but but the difference now is is that those guys are fruits. So I, I don't I don't I, I I can't I can't like relate to the fact that they would do that. I just, anyway, but whatever. It's both of them are sin and both of them are wicked as hell. But the point is is that you can understand it in normal depravity, but now it's just gotten ridiculous. When you were a kid, you'd be like, oh, "Well, sure, you want to do that, but you ain't doing it." Your dad would be like, "You ain't doing that." Yeah, go chop some wood. Right? But what do we have today? I I'll tell you what, if God's people didn't mix these 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 uh roles up and do what they've done with all of this, it the world wouldn't be so easily doing it. If there are people that were standing up, but you know what, you know why the churches are so silent about most of this and they are very silent in my opinion. Very silent, not bold voices. Why? Cuz they already compromised it a long time ago. They already start because women already started cross dressing a long time ago, and it was accepted in all the churches. They already started dressing like men a long time ago. That's that Q Amen right there. That's what that that Amen, because that's because that's what happened. They started cross dressing a long time ago and dressing like men. Why is it why is it bad for Jaden Smith to do it, but why is it okay for Christian women to do it? And chop their hair off and all those other things. Why is that okay? It isn't. That's the answer. But when you compromise like that, that's why Christianity is silent in America. They don't have nothing to say. 
What can they say? What can they say? Is that too, is that too blunt? It's sad that, that, that a preacher has to actually stand up and say that. But I have to make sure your children understand, you know, boys are boys, girls are girls, and boys don't join Girl Scouts, and girls don't join Boy Scouts. Did you ever think that you would ever have to say that in your life? And there's no such thing as gender, is it fluidity? Did I say that right? Fruitity? There's no, there's, there's no, there's no such thing as that. And yes, I will forever tell them that, no, you have a, a spiritual disorder. That's what that is. That's a spiritual disorder. That's a spiritual problem right there. That's exactly what that is. Exactly what it is. I'm telling you, you can't, we're not going to be able to escape this culture war. You're not going to be able to just walk away from it and act like it's not part of your life. You're not going to be able to do that. If God's people walk away, they're going to they're gonna forfeit everything. In this land, they will forfeit it. They cannot walk away from the culture war. They've got to face it head on. They have to tell them how absolutely ridiculous that is. And it still is absolutely ridiculous. Right? I never thought I'd see the day when I was preaching at that one event and that guy came up to me and he got mad at me because I said there were two genders. And he blew up on me. Do you remember that? You were there, Brother Andrew. I remember when I said that and that guy and he got, he got just irate about that. I don't know how I got off on this, but anyway. Oh, I was talking about women. but <laughs> Women and the, and the Bible and the pouring out of the Spirit. But if these things weren't compromised religiously... There wouldn't be so much deception today. It wouldn't be so easy. But because churches don't stand for anything anymore, they fall for everything. That's like why that guy dares to go and, and claim he's a pastor of a Lutheran church and marry a man. That's why he can do that. Because nobody told him, look, you're not a Christian. You're lost and on your way to hell. You're a dirty pervert. That's exactly what you are, is a dirty pervert. And you're going to die and go to hell, a dirty pervert, if you don't repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you don't turn from your wicked, perverted sin. And stay away from my kids, you pervert. You used to be men talk like that. Right? Used to be. Is that, is that too much? Is that, is that too much for you? In, in today's culture, am I, am I away from the world enough by myself studying and praying and reading and everything else that when I come out of the wilderness, so to speak, and preach to you, is it too much because you're around it all day long that your preacher would smack you over the head with a dose of reality and tell you it's a bunch of perversion, it's wicked as hell and God hates it? And God will judge the bloody whore. He will judge her and throw her in the bed and burn her. And that's where America's headed right now. It's where America's headed. It's a spirit of perversion, and it's there. It's very evident. It's sad. Now, Joel's prophecy. Let's look at that. One of the key notes of the Pentecostal movement has been the teaching that the Lord's coming will be preceded by a revival of signs and wonders, which is not true in that sense that they try to make it. They take these verses in Acts chapter 2, verse number 16 to 21, as their main proof text. And they call this the doctrine of the latter rain. They believe there is a beginning rain, a first rain that is to come down, and then uh, when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit took place, and then of the miracle-working power in the church age, one at the beginning of the age and one at the end of the age, they say. But I don't believe that that holds up to Scripture when you start to look at it. Number one, Peter says Joel's prophecy was fulfilled in his day by the events at Pentecost. He does not say that it will be fulfilled throughout the church age. He doesn't say that. If you read those verses, he doesn't say that those signs and wonders are going to be a part of that forever. He doesn't say that at all. That's not what he's implying. The pouring out of the Spirit is focused on what? Prophesying. Which is mentioned twice in that section of Scripture. When you look at Acts chapter 2, verse number 17, and you look at it through verse 18, what is it? Prophesying is mentioned twice. Why is it mentioned twice? Because that's what the focus is. That's the importance. 
Now, there's two types of prophecy in the Bible. There's, there's foretelling or forthtelling, okay? There's both. One is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and preaching a message to them. One is, is telling of events that will come to pass. Both of these are done by Peter in this sense right here. He is preaching the gospel to them. He's ready to, and he is preaching what is going to come or the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. He takes them back to that and says, look, this is what's going to happen. And what does this, this describes the writing of the New Testament under divine inspiration and the completion of the canon of Scripture. The gift of prophecy was a gift to lay the foundation of the church. In Ephesians 2.20, turn there, please. Look in your Bibles here, Ephesians 2.20. It says here, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So that prophecy that was the, the foretelling of what was going to take place in the future was only to lay the foundation of the church. That's all it was for. It wasn't to continue forever because Peter says we have a more sure word of prophecy, and that's the word of God. So Peter himself says that. Once its purpose was fulfilled, this prophesying, that version of prophecy ceased to function, just as the gift of tongues ceased. It was not necessary anymore. It was a sign that was given, and it was not necessary any longer, nor is it necessary today. So it is not given today in that sense. The heavenly signs will occur at the end of the age. There are some signs that are going to come. As stated by Peter, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Well, we know some of those signs. We're going to talk about those, actually. Um, the heavenly signs are described in Jesus' prophecy as well. Remember Matthew chapter 24? Let's go there, Matthew 24. These signs are going to sound familiar to you. You've heard these before. I've preached on these. But they're going to sound familiar to you. Matthew 24. Verse number 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's when Jesus comes. There are some signs that are coming. Okay? There are. What are those signs? We said in Revelation chapter, what is it? After the sixth seal? That's when these signs take place. So there are signs that are coming. But it's to mark the end of the age. But it's not a latter reign of a revival that's going to take place where everything's going to be great and we're going to usher in this wonderful spiritual utopia that everything's going to be perfect. No, this world's waxing worse and worse. It's getting wicked as hell out there, and it's going to get a lot worse. Amen. It's going to get a lot worse, friend. I'm going to tell you what. You better be on your toes, and you better be praying to God, and you better be seeking God's face, and you better be separating from the world and worldliness and wickedness because it's going to get worse, and the deception is going to get stronger. It's already uh, strong and powerful out there, we can see, but the Bible says that that strong delusion is coming. It is going to come, and we can see it. Revelation 6, verse number 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. And of the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks in the mountains of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The great day of the wrath of the Lamb is coming. Right? And there's your signs and wonders. Right. And what happens to these people? They want to die and God's not going to let them die. They're going to live. They're not they're not going to be able to die for a while because God's not going to let them die. So we see here that 
these we believe these signs and wonders are going to take these signs are going to take place they're going to happen the rest of the new testament describes only apostasy Joel, Peter is not preaching to them that they're going to have these signs and wonders and this wonderful revival is going to be a latter rain revival that's going to take place. No. It's marked with the rest of Christianity in the end times is marked with apostasy. That's really what it's marked with. A sign of only apostasy and false miracles. If you look at uh, Matthew 24 again, turn there. Yep, Matthew 24, verse number 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And what are these charismatics doing? Right, exactly. And you see the other stuff they're doing, like the guy the other day uh, said that he raised, that they, they proved him false. He was put a coffin in there and he said he raised this guy from the dead. He put a coffin there, and all, all these Nigerians over there were believing it, running around, and and it was a it was a farce. Yep, false, false miracles, apostasy. That marks the end of the age. Second Thessalonians chapter two. We've been there. We'll go back there. It's important to understand that Joel's prophecy here that Peter is giving is not. He is not saying that there's going to be this end times latter rain revival this revival of all the gifts of the spirit or the uh the gifts of the spirit that were temporary gifts healing raising the dead uh all these other things drinking poison and all these other things that these people try to teach today the charismatic movement teaches today that's not what joel's prophecy was about second thessalonians chapter two verse number six and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the, mis <clears throat> for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he, who now let, he, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. They're going to get their signs and wonders what they want. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. Can't you see it? I mean, is there any more comfortable of a place for Satan to sit today than most churches in America? I can't think of a more comfortable place for, the, for him to sit than in the average churches today in America. They do not preach the gospel any longer. Christ is not exalted any longer. No, no sound doctrine. The word of God is not preached any longer. They've traded it in. But they are religious people. I think one of the most damning things that has happened in America and to people in general in America in churches is that people for some reason don't get the fact that religious people that are looking for a Jesus are the ones that are going to usher in the Antichrist. Like they don't get that. They don't get and that's because of the delusion. But they don't get that the false Christ that that Lutheran homosexual pastor is pushing the one that lets him be a, a, a sodomite. That one is the Antichrist. That's the one that they don't get that. No, it's not going to. He's not going to come walking in as a dragon. And he's not going to come in with his dragon tail everywhere and breathing fire. No, he's going to come in as the angel of light. Right. Under the guise that everybody can go along to get along. We can all work everything out. We can all get along. That's the charismatic movement. That's where it's headed. And that's where all these lying, these signs and lying wonders are. The signs are real. The wonders are lies. OK, but that's what it is. And that's where it's headed. It's not a latter rain of a revival. When's the last time you saw any of those charismatics really, truly, the ones that are out there really preach uh, holiness and righteousness by Jesus Christ or the gospel or against sin? You don't. Neither any of these other churches. Look, let me ask you a question. If you were to walk into that Lutheran church that has that sodomite pastor and you sat in there, for his service, would you do you think you'd be convicted over any sin? I mean, yeah, his. 
But do you think that you would be convicted, though? Do you think you would hear a message that would be convicting? No. Of course you wouldn't. Of course you wouldn't, because that's not what he's there to do. It's just a religious country club. It's a religious rotary club. That's what it is. It's a religious club. And the object is not Christ. The object is the happiness of man. Humanism. And that's why even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders will be so comfortable there. Because that, when he pops up on the scene, they're going to be like, yeah. Hey, he's the guy we're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Hill song or hell song. Right? Think about it. Think about it this way, okay? And I wasn't planning on talking about this this long, but it, it's just there. So, But th- think about this, though. Here's, here are these guys preparing the way for the Antichrist. Absolutely preparing his way. Making his path straight. Completely. To where he's going to come on the scene and look at what, what Pope Francis is doing right now. He has, he has basically promoted homosexuality, transgenders. He has promoted, uh, he's, he's changing the priesthood. He is, he is doing all of these things right openly in front of everybody. Divorce, whatever it is, he's changing everything. All the tenets, why? Because it's transforming. It's transforming before their eyes. So then when the Antichrist rises up from the beast system, when he rises up from there, there isn't going to be, there are going to be billions of people that are going to be like, yeah, it's right here. It's easy. It's all set up. There's nothing to stand in his way but us. But those that preach the gospel, those that hold up the word of God, those that still believe. Right? So we look at it here. It says, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and then that perish, he's not going to come in like a dragon. He's going to speak like a lamb. And they're going to accept him. He's just going to be accepted because he's going to accept everyone. Acceptance and love. Don't you hear him? Jesus loved everybody. Acceptance and love. We want to accept it. God loves everyone. God loves everybody. God loves everybody. Right. That's what they say, right? When you hear him, that's what they say. So what's going to happen? He's, the Antichrist is going to pop up on the scene, and they're going to be like, well, there he is. We told you God loves everybody. You Christians have it all wrong. We told you God loves everybody. We told you. He just hates you, and you're in the way. You're stopping our evolution. You're stopping the transformation. So we have to stop you. Yep, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and then that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. What is the lie? The charismatic lie. All of it that's out there. There's lying signs and wonders. The charismatic movement, the Roman Catholicism that's being transformed before. All apostate religion is going to be accepted. Listen. Let me, let, let me, let, let's, let's talk about two things that stands in the way right now. Here are the two things. One, yep, the Holy Spirit is there. Yep, and he is, and he is restraining evil. Okay? The Holy Spirit, the Jesus of the Bible being preached, right? Right? And his church, that is, those that are faithful in the church that are standing up the word and with the word of God, and they have the Bible, they have the, the perfect word of God, and they are standing in the way of the apostasy. But there are so many churches today that are that are falling away. They're get, they're, they're they're getting sucked into everything. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. See, they're going to believe the religious lie. God loves everybody. It's the religious lie. God accepts everybody. God's not mad at anybody. Like Joyce Meyer said, God's not mad at you, Jacob. God's not mad at you. Right? 
That's what she said. She wrote a book, God's Not Mad at You. No, he's angry with you. Right? He's angry. That's right. But what, what do we see here? So this marks the end times. As we can see in this list here, what's going to take place? And then you go to, uh, let's see, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Amen. Yep. But evil men, yeah, that's right, rebellion. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And then we have chapter 4 here of 2 Timothy, verse 3 and 4. Well, actually, go back to verse 2. He says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So what do they have? They have a, a Christ that is a fable. The Masonic Christ. Right? It's a fable. A cunningly devised fable. But it's a fable. It's a Masonic fable, right? Right. But they have that Jesus. See, here's where and I, and I know I've talked about this before, but I can't help it. It bothers me so much because. The real attack is not going to be. No, Jesus or a Jesus. Oh, no, don't be that deceived. That isn't that simple. No, choose between all of these false Christs and the real one. How, how do you know that? Here's how I know that. Choose between all those false versions or this one. Do you see it? Do you see it? How many of those are there? Thousands. How many are right? One. If he just tried to, look, he, Satan already figured this out. He tried to destroy it. Listen, he tried to bury it. He tried to burn it. He tried to get rid of it, and he couldn't. So he said, hey, I know what I'll do. I'll make more of them, and I'll pervert them, and I'll make thousands of them, and thousands of them to cause confusion in the land. So then what did he say? What did Christ say would come? Confusion. What do we have with the transgender movement? Confusion. What do we have with gender fluidity? Confusion. What do we have with the homosexual music? Confusion. What did God say all those sins were in the Old Testament that they weren't to do? Confusion. He said they wrought confusion in Israel by those, those fornication and those sins and that wickedness. So what did he say was marked to these end times? Confusion. Confusion. That's what it is. And that's what we have today. And that's where these charismatics and all these others that are driven by those things, that's where they're going to cause confusion. Because it's not to choose between. He said many shall arise. Many false Christs shall arise and deceive many. So today, when you go out and you evangelize, you know, it's not so much that those out in the world don't know who the Christ of the Bible is. I'm more concerned with the people in the church not knowing who the Christ of the Bible is. When you have the many misrepresentations of who he is. Right? That's the problem today. A major one. There is no promise of an end time revival of apostolic miracles as Pentecostals and Charismatics teach. It's not true. It's not anywhere there. Old Testament prophecy does describe an outpouring of the Spirit with accompanying miracles when Christ's kingdom comes. When Christ comes back, there's going to be a lot of miracles. There are some miscellaneous uh, me uh, messages or lessons, though, from Joel's prophecy. Number one, the emphasis is on salvation. Now, we're not going to get into this real deep today, but next time we preach on this next next uh, Wednesday, Lord willing, is when I'll talk about this, okay? However, here it is, okay? His whole message is about the gospel. 
The emphasis that Peter has when he starts here, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's the gospel. It's salvation. It's not gifts. They were never instructed to get gifts. You don't see that anywhere. But that's exactly what, that's exactly what the charismatic movement and those try to portray. The emphasis is on salvation. Why? Because that's what God delights in, in saving sinners. Amen? 1 Thessalonians, or excuse me, 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 3 through 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. Amen? God wants men saved. That's why God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins, right? That's why, because he wants men to be saved. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. If men want to go to hell, he'll let them. Amen? If they want to, he'll let them, but he doesn't want them to. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. why he sent him amen that's why he came to earth he shall save his people from their sins uh, i'm not sure i have to look luke luke chapter 19 verse 10 what's that is it yep matthew that's right matthew chapter 1 verse 21 it's sins, right? Yeah. Matthew 121. Going the wrong way. That's what his name means, though. His name means that he shall save his people. What do they need to save from? Sin. Amen? That's what they need to save from. This was God's great act of love towards man. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That was God's greatest act of love to man. Now, what is the last days? We should define the last days. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse number 17. I think it's important to understand that too, the last days, because we hear those words a lot. We talk about them a lot. Acts chapter 2, verse number 17 and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. In the last days. Okay, so we see that phrase used a few different times. Turn to Hebrews chapter 1. In verse number 2. Verse number one says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. In these last days. Right? The last days is a period of time during which the Lord's prophetic purposes will be fulfilled. It began with the first coming of Christ in Hebrews 1.21. It covers the days of the apostles as well as the events of Revelation when the Antichrist shall rise. It extends to the millennial kingdom. 1 John chapter 2. Verse number 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard, the Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Waiting for the one Antichrist to come, though, right? And it extends all the way into the millennial kingdom. Those are the last days. So what is the day of the Lord? We've talked about this before. Uh, it refers to the coming of Christ to judge the world and establish his kingdom. The day of the Lord, right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse number 2. Verse number one says, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. 
For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Amen. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. and They shall not escape. Those are the, those are the, that's the day of the Lord. We understand that the day of the Lord is the, the fiery judgment of God when he comes, right? And he's going to fix everything. He's going to take care of everything, right? Um, it's after, we also understand that's after the sixth seal, obviously, and after a few things that take place. And, you know, we're not going to get into all that, but, but there's a lot that can be said about that. It refers primarily to the exaltation of God to his rightful position as almighty ruler. When Jesus comes to rule and reign. In this present time, David Cloud says, man has exalted himself against God, but in the day, in that day, God will be exalted and man humbled. There's coming a day. You know. So another thing that we should talk about, though, in closing here for a few things, is is what about women uh, and prophesying? Because these verses, it talks about that a little bit, and I think there can be some confusion to that as far as what that means and everything. Acts chapter 2, verse number 17, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So it talks about them, the sons and the daughters, right? God gifts women in spiritual things. No doubt every woman here that is saved has spiritual gifts. All right? But they are restricted in the exercise thereof. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Here's the problem. When someone tries to tell you there are no restrictions on those gifts, that's when the true problem comes in. Because there are restrictions that God laid out for a purpose and for a reason. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 12. Well, verse number 11, actually verse number 9, in, uh, actually verse number 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. It says to men lift up holy hands, right? In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Women are to be modest. With shamefacedness and sobriety. There's nothing more dangerous than a silly woman. Do you understand that? There's nothing more dangerous than a silly woman. Nothing. One that cannot be sober. One that cannot be serious. It's dangerous. Very dangerous. It can cause a lot of problems. With shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Do you profess godliness with good works? Lady, I hope you do. I hope that's your goal. Professing godliness with good works. That should be your goal. Amen. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. I'm just curious, lady, the first time you heard that, did that really, like, make you mad? <laughs> or did you not understand that when you heard that the first time? Like, what is that supposed to mean? Because that, in this society, I can understand why a woman would think that way as soon as she heard that, right? Because not being taught those things. They... Joshua, what is it they would call me if I if I said that in your college? Yeah. That's what they call me. They probably think I need it if I said that. Right? But 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 I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man but to be in silence. So her gifts are to be governed by the place that God has put her. They're governed by that. But they are to be exercised. But I suffer not a woman to teach. It says, for Adam was first formed. He gives the reason. Here's the reason for the silence. Here's the reason for no leadership in that sense. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. That's the first reason. Because that's God, God made man first. That's the first reason. 
Makes sense, doesn't it? All right. And Adam was not deceived. That's the next reason. Adam wasn't deceived. He knew full well what he was doing. Which is worse for him, by the way. Because <laughs> he knew better. <laughs> but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. She actually was fooled. She said it. She put, see, that serpent beguiled me. That tricky snake got me. She was actually tricked. She was deceived in spiritual matters. Do you understand that? Do, do you understand that? These are spiritual matters. She was deceived in spiritual matters. I just did a devotion this morning on Abraham's wife. She was definitely deceived. She followed her own emotions and thought, boy, this will be great. She didn't follow them out far enough. Because it was not great. It was a really dumb idea. Right? Right? It was really bad. Really bad idea. In that, she followed Eve. A really dumb. And Abraham followed Adam. And hearkened unto the voice of his wife. Right? Think about that. This is not saying that you're stupid. It's saying that this is the judgment that God has pronounced upon you. And you must abide by that. Right? And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So this is the place. That hasn't changed. So the Apostle Paul is saying to you, the order of the sexes is not changed. Because you have the gift of the spirits, right, or the, or the, the gifts of the spirit, uh, because you have that, it doesn't mean that the order has changed. It doesn't mean that you can act out of that order. It doesn't mean that's changed. That hasn't changed. It's still the same. If you haven't noticed it after you got saved, ladies, you're still a woman. Have you noticed that? <laughs> I don't expect you to answer me. I'm just saying. <laughs> have you noticed? I just, I just want to say, yeah, yeah. I, but. Have you noticed that? I was testing you to see if you were to be silent in church. <laughs> you passed. All right. Amen. <laughs> no. But you see, you're still a woman. And after I got saved, I was still a man. Thank God. Right? You're a better woman now. You're a better lady now that you're saved. Amen? But you're still a lady. Subject to the same things. Only you have the Spirit of God in you. But the order has to be the same. That doesn't change. All right? Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So what he's saying is, is that your place is the home. That's what that means. Even if you don't have children, he's, she's saying that's the place is the home. Right? That you're to continue in charity and holiness and sobriety. That's what God wants you to be is holy. You understand that? That's what God wants his men to be, holy. He wants ladies to be holy. Amen? All right. The woman's ministry is to be focused toward women and toward children. Right? That's verse 15 that we just talked about. And Titus chapter 2, by the way. Let's go there. Verse 3 through 5. That the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior, the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior, as becometh holiness. Man, he says that again. Aged women. Look, he says, be holy. He says that they be in behavior, as becometh holiness. It's your behavior. You are challenged by your behavior. Your example is how you behave yourself. That's your example. That's your witness. How you behave yourself. Right? Not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. That they may teach the young women to be sober. There you go. 
How do you, how would you suppose elder Christian or older Christian lady or aged Christian lady, how do you teach younger women to be sober? By being sober, your behavior being sober yourself. By being an example. You teach them to be sober. What does that mean exactly? Well, I don't have time to get into that because this could go a long time. But here's what I will say to you. What it means is, is that that you direct them to keep their hearts towards their husbands and towards their children by your godly example of doing the same. You teach them to be long-suffering by you being long-suffering. And you give them godly advice in the same way. Right? Women to be sober and love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, Keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. All right? So what it says here, that's her primary sphere of ministry. It does not mean that a woman cannot witness to a man about salvation. It doesn't mean that either. There may be times when you're going to be someplace that you would witness to a man. There might be a situation like that. But it's not public preaching. It's not standing up and lifting up your voice like a trumpet. Not the same thing. But witnessing, absolutely. You should. Amen? Those women were sent to witness to the apostles of the resurrection, weren't they? He sent them back. But it wasn't an open discourse in front of a, a whole assembly. He says, no, go tell Peter. Go be a witness of the resurrection. Go tell him. Right? But she didn't stop acting like a lady. You understand? There's a difference. Priscilla helped her husband teach Apollos, right, in Acts chapter 18, verse number 24. She helped him. What is forbidden is for women to teach men from a position of authority, such as leading an adult Sunday school class or a mixed congregation composed of men and women or even a Bible college class of preaching authoritatively to a group of men like Gail Ripplinger going to Hiles Anderson and preaching to all those guys stand there like a man. I know. I know. I get in trouble for, for that kind of stuff. Don't I make them all mad for that? Makes it. Yeah. What's the matter with you? Do you know that makes it okay? Yeah. By the way, number two is important to note that there were no women apostles. You think if Jesus wanted a woman preaching, he'd ordained an apostle. Yeah. They're one of them women apostles. Didn't happen, did it? And God's standards for pastors apply only to men. The husband of one wife. That is to men. Right? So the Bible says. Very clear. The pastor had to be a husband there. Number three, people talk about Philip's daughters prophesying. But when God wanted to give a prophetic message to Paul, he brought a man to do it in Acts chapter 21. Look at it. People say, oh, look at the, uh, Philip's daughters prophesied. Where? At their house? Prophesy over those potatoes. <laughs> Prophesy over some pie. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The daughter's prophesying. That's right. That's it. Yeah, good. Acts chapter 21. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was laughing about prophesying over pie and <laughs> prophesy over them cookies. <laughs> Right? They're prophesying over those dishes. <laughs> oh, um. <laughs> Lucius is trying not to laugh. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the point, you know, I mean, but she's witnessing there, right? That's where she's witnessing at. That's where it is. Home. 
Somebody's got to do it. She's the one ordained to do it. Right? That's the, that's the place that God gave her. Acts chapter 21, verse number 8. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Sisera. And we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. Wait a minute. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth the girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Well, there were four women there prophesying. Why didn't he use them? That's not even what they were supposed to do. Right? Very simple examples, right? I know that upsets people, but they're very simple. Uh, number four, the examples of female prophets in the Old Testament, such as Deborah and, and such, are not examples for New Testament believers. And see my sermon on what about Deborah and other lame excuses women use to usurp authority over men. Did you? Amen. Anyway. Anyway, that's Joel's prophecy, okay? And it's it's simple. It's not speaking of a latter-day reign of gifts that are poured down in a charismatic way. It does speak about the day of the Lord coming, and there will be signs there, and there'll be some wonders, right? Yep. Yes. The frogs come out and do the miracles, too, as devils, right? Working miracles. Oh, absolutely, those churches. But see, that's the thing. And that's what the Bible said, that they were going to rise up and they were going to do those signs and lying wonders. They were going to do them. They were going to have power to do them. And as it gets worse and waxes worse, it's going to get it's going to get real deceptive. But Christians are going to that have the spirit of God are going to look at that and be like, that ain't real. Why? Because it's not according to the book. So we know it's not real. And this is what God has given us. This is what we hold on to. Amen. This is what we trust. What we read in the Word of God, that's what we trust. We don't trust our, we try the spirits whether they're of God. We do. That's right. And they're tried by this book. And if they don't pass, then we throw them away. Amen? We don't, we disregard them. We don't accept them. You know, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. If you can't find it in here, it ain't real, or it ain't of God. God doesn't want you to do it. Amen? So anyway, but that puts in perspective the kind of the ladies' ministry. Next week, we're going to talk about, and the charismatic movement, because that's really a big push for them, the charismatic the, the women. They always put them up in the forefront. It's, kinda, it's, it's their big push. But that's, that's what that was prophesied about. So um, the Lord warned us about all that. But next week, we'll talk about G the message of Peter, which was Christ. Peter's message was Christ. And he definitively preached the doctrine of Christ to those people. So, and we'll go through that. And, and that's the focus, and that ought to be the focus of all of our, is Christ. All of our preaching, all of our understanding, this book, everything, it ought to be Christ. Christ-centered. Amen? The Christ of the Bible. I believe that if I teach you more and more about Jesus Christ, you will be strengthened in your faith. And you will stand against the apostasy that will arise because you'll have the truth and you'll know the Christ of the Bible. You'll know him very well. Amen? And that's important. Father, Lord, thank you. We pray you would just bless us, Lord, and help us understand from your book the truth. And, Lord, help us to follow Christ and not be deceived or not be swayed by cunningly devised fables, not to be moved, Lord, from the truths of the scriptures, but to be strong and to stand strong in these end times of confusion, Lord, and be a light in a dark world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.